Ventures, if you haven't been here yet. Um, this is our new entrepreneurial space on campus. Sounds really loud. Is it really loud? It does? Okay. All right, so tonight is the first of our Real Talk series. And our Real Talk series is just meant to be kind of a casual fireside chat, just like this, bringing in some interesting folks from West Virginia with this common thread of innovation, exploration, entrepreneurship. And so tonight our theme is space exploration, which is why we have Duncan and Mara here, uh, two astrophysicists at WVU who are gonna be talking about their research and expertise here. So to get us started, uh, we did wanna just take a moment, kind of given the topic of tonight's conversation and uh, just the impact that she's made on the world, just to acknowledge the passing of Katherine Johnson this week. Um, and so if you don't know much about Katherine, she's actually from West Virginia. She was born and raised in White Sulphur Springs um, and at the age of 10 entered into high school. It gets me more impressive from there. At 18, she graduated summa cum laude from WVU with degrees in mathematics and French. Still gets more impressive. 1939, uh, she enrolled in graduate school at WVU and was one of the first three black students and the first black female to attend the university. After graduating, Catherine went on to work as an engineer at NASA uh, and was one of the ones responsible for determining the trajectory that was necessary to make the successful Apollo moon landing. In 2015, Catherine received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And this past July, at 100 years old, made it to a ribbon cutting ceremony in Fairmont, uh, West Virginia for the rededication of the NASA facility, which has been so appropriately renamed after her. Catherine was an inspiration to so many and her memory will live on indefinitely. If you've not read her book or seen the movie Hidden Figures, I would highly recommend it. Um, it's an incredible way to learn more about her impact, the impact of Mary Jackson and Dorothy Vaughn and their impact on our space community, but more broadly as our nation and our world. Okay, so with that tonight, Duncan and Mara, like I mentioned, are here, here to talk about their contributions to space exploration, their expertise, and just to have kind of a fun, casual conversation about what life is like in West Virginia and what you do. Uh, so Mara is an expert, expert in pulsar systems and is a distinguished professor of physics and astronomy here at WVO. Yep. Uh, Duncan is a radio astronomer and fellow of the American Physical Society. So to get started, I actually want to take maybe a, I don't know, 20 year journey back or so to your time in Puerto Rico, which I understand is where you met. So can you tell the crowd here a little bit about what brought you to Puerto Rico? Why were you there? And then what brought you together while you were in Puerto Rico? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> where do we begin? Want to start? Sure. Oh, I'll start. Um, so thanks everyone for coming out. It's great, great to, uh, to be, be in this space. Um, I was 20, yeah, 20 years ago, plus two, 2008, no, 1998, uh, I moved to, uh, to Puerto Rico. Uh, I was a postdoc at the time. It was my second postdoc uh, after graduating. Um, I'd just come from Germany, so I went from Germany to Puerto Rico. Uh, it's a quite different environment. Uh, and um, I was working down there as a postdoc, and then I got taken on as a staff scientist at the observatory. It's a, um, for those of you who have not um, heard of the observatory, you, you may have seen the movie GoldenEye. It's the, it's, the, it's the large dish that features in that. It's also in the movie Contact. So I, I showed up just a couple of years after they, they finished those movies. And so it was, it was a really popular place to be. Um, That's why you went, right? Yeah, that was the reason I went. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it was just a, it was just a fun time to be there. Uh, if you get the chance to go to Puerto Rico, definitely um, do so. If you've not not been already, and definitely go to the observatory. Anyway, I was um, working there um, as and I was your scientific liaison, I guess is the technical term for it. So I, I would help observers um, collect their data uh, and. Um, so it was, uh, it was you, know, you just get to meet people from all over the world. And Laura came down and, well, I'll let her tell the story, but she was a student at Cornell University. Yes, yeah, so I was a graduate student at Cornell, getting my PhD at the time. 
Um, and Cornell actually operated this telescope in Puerto Rico, which is why I'd gone there, because I'd been to this huge telescope as an undergraduate, and I just thought it was so cool. Um, yeah, and I went down, and, and Dunk was a pulsar astronomer there. Um, and our first interaction was actually very unpleasant. Do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> like all great love stories, <laughs> start with the first place. Yeah, I had taken a ton of pulsar data, and we take data you know, at very high rates, so it takes up like a lot of space and it has, needs a lot of computational power. And I would like sneak around people's computers, like trying to suck up their CPU cycles without them noticing to like process my data on and send jobs on. And I was running jobs on his computer without permission. And I got this email that was, you know, what are you doing? This is my computer. This is not for students. You know, signed Dr. Lorimer. It was like very angry. I think I signed it, Dr. Lorimer. Yes, you did. I remember. <laughs> Do we have a copy of this email? It was a very like authoritative email. I remember thinking this guy must be like a total jerk, you know. Um, but then he ended up not being a jerk, obviously. And, and <laughs> yeah. And then here you are today. Here we are. Today. <laughs> That's you see the wonderful. other side of the scientific liaison. It's like, <laughs> you have to be, you know, tough at times. <laughs> That's great. So you spent time down in Puerto Rico and then straight line to West Virginia or were there stops along the way in between? Well, we made a big stop in England, actually. Okay. Um, so around the time that I was finishing my PhD, Dunk got a fellowship in England, a, a Royal Society fellowship, That's which is what right. it was called, um, which is a five-year fellowship um, at the University of Manchester. And then I was lucky enough to get a fellowship from the National Science Foundation to also go there, like an international postdoc fellowship. Um, so that was very lucky that we both were able to go to England together. Yeah. And then we spent five years there before taking the jobs here. Okay. And what, what initially attracted you to West Virginia? Was it just the opportunity? Was it the Green Bank Observatory? Was it a combination of everything? I'd say it was the Green Bank Telescope. Yeah. Sure, that, was the, that was the only thing that we knew about West Virginia okay. uh, initially. Um, we both of us had been there um, before, you know, as, yeah. as astronomers, and uh, yeah, we were just fascinated by this uh, this giant telescope, and you know, we got to know Morgantown just through the job opportunity. Yeah, it was uh, it was very. We not, neither of us expected to be there, be here. No, not at all. Yeah, yeah. it was also attractive because they they you know there's this massive telescope nearby, and when we started here, there was one astronomer. And no one who used the telescope. There wasn't a single radio astronomer here, which was just silly, really, to be so close to Green Bank. And so the university decided they really wanted to grow the astronomy program. And so we kind of knew that we were the first two, but we'd get to like have a hand in yeah. you know, the future directions and hires. And that was very exciting. And can you tell us a little bit more? What What is the capabilities of the Green Bank Observatory and the telescope? Because I think a lot of people probably even a lot of West Virginians don't really appreciate how incredible of a resource and a tool it is that we have in our own backyard. So can you tell us a little bit about how it functions, why it's special, and then what's the relationship like with WVU using that equipment? Okay. Um, I can do, maybe I'll do the first part. Sure. <laughs> um, so it's the largest fully steerable radio telescope uh, in the world. So we, we just talked about Arecibo, which is 300 meters. Uh, it's fixed into the ground. And so it's uh, you can't steer it around the sky freely. Um, but Green Bank is 100 meters in diameter, so it's smaller, but it can see 85% of the whole sky because it can go up from horizon to horizon. Uh, and you know, throughout the course of the year, you get to see almost all the sky. So it's amazing from that perspective. Um, it, but the really cool thing about it, in my opinion, is it's, it's, it, it can go from radio waves that are sort of this big or even longer um, to radio waves that are millimeter wavelengths. So it can span um, many octaves of uh, radio frequency from about um, 100 megahertz to 100 gigahertz. And does that bring a lot of people here that want to that want to use it, like visiting scientists and all over the world? Yeah. yeah. So it, it's so we use it for pulsars, which we'll talk about more in a bit. But, yeah. um, People uh, from all around the world use it to study comets uh, in the solar system, to study distant quasars in the universe, study the sun um, and other nearby stars. Just just about anything you can think of, that telescope can play a role and has done. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and so is it managed by WVU? Is it a partnership? It's it, So it's its own standalone organization? Yeah, I mean, it's funded by the National Science Foundation, okay. primarily. 
well, it, it was funded solely by the National Science Foundation for many years, and now the funding model is changing a little bit. Mm -hmm. But WEB doesn't have any formal role in managing the telescope, um, although we've had a lot of kind of informal collaborations, like things like, for instance, astronomers at Green Bank can serve on our PhD student committees. Um, we have access to some small telescopes on at Green Bank, so it's not just the big thing. There's a bunch of little telescopes, too. Um, and outreach project. Um, we use the site. Oh, people not hear me. Just well? Did I press it? Might have pressed the button. Sure. Is better? I can just talk loud. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so we use the site like for education and outreach projects. Um, we work with like, students want to do like an engineering project. They can go down there and work with an engineer on site. So it just sort of expands what we can do here by working with people at Green Bank. The time itself on the telescope, though, is very hard to get. Okay. Um, it's very competitive. So Green Bank, you know, they don't just say, yeah, because you're in WBU, like you can have all this time on the telescope. We have to compete for it like everybody else. Um, but WBU does provide some funding for us um, directly to purchase time on the telescope, like just for WBU research projects. Mm -hmm. So that's really amazing. Um, the university is so committed to the telescope and to keeping it operational um, that they contribute funding, you know, just for astronomers here to use, which is really nice. Very cool. And can people go down there? Like if you want to go get a tour, yeah, sure. Bank, yeah. people, the community yeah. can. It's an amazing, have you been there? Have people been there? There's an amazing. I have not, now I want to go. So I'm like, I'm like, when can I sign up for a tour? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a really nice science center, like a little science museum. And there's a tour bus that will take you all around the site and down to the telescope. There's also bus, um, um, bikes there. Like, there's these old bikes they keep in. That's the best way to get around, honestly, because yeah. you can just, like, you can't drive your car to the telescope because your spark plugs in your car give off radio interference. Okay. Um, but you can walk down or just bike down. It's a really nice site. It's definitely worth a visit. Yeah. All right. And if anyone goes, you can always email us, and if we're there, we'll show you around and give you a behind-the-scenes tour. Okay, so schedule ahead of time with these <laughs> folks clearly is the golden ticket there. You okay. I did him over the summer there. Okay. If anyone comes in the summer, the best we're off in there. Sure. Best time. Yeah, and you need a weekend really because it, it's a long day trip, but uh, it's a three hour drive. But yeah, okay. and, there's, and there's tons of other stuff to see around there. Great. Yeah. And, and so talking about the capabilities of the, the observatory and, and in particular the two of you and how you have used it. Um, I understand that you discovered the, the largest neutron star ever recorded and you did it using the telescope there. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Is that a day process? I'm assuming not. Is it a week, a month, a year? Are you using multiple telescopes? What does that look like? Well, I mean, it's like a, it's just part of a, um, a lifetime of work. I, and you could say really, you know, we, we don't, I think neither of us got into astronomy mm -hmm. to, to study, you know, to look for, you know, the biggest neutron star. We didn't wake up one morning right. to do that, but, we, I think both what drives both of us is to use these telescopes to look for neutron stars. So we should maybe step back and say what those are. Um, so ima you know, imagine the, um, the mass of the sun compressed down into the size of Morgantown. Uh, so you get these uh, incredibly dense star and these, are, these, these can be formed um, through supernova explosions. Um, so they're formed about once every century in the galaxy. Um, and they spin incredibly rapidly and they generate um, electromagnetic waves all across the spectrum and they, as, and they sweep um, these beams of radiation along the magnetic poles as they rotate so that you get these pulses of radiation um, that we can see really readily with radio telescopes. But you need a big telescope usually. So that's the phenomenon. And so both of us are kind of driven to find those because we just find them so fascinating. They spin incredibly rapidly. They're like clocks, basically, yeah. in the sky. And so, you know, my own uh, personal uh, interest has been in, like, the population of these in the, in the Milky Way. Like, so it's like doing a census. You know, we're in the middle of the 2020 census now, <laughs> okay. or just beginning it, I guess. And so, you know, I, I'm interested in doing a census of neutron stars and, and trying to find out all the different types of them. And so we use telescopes all around the world to do that. And then every now and again, we find really odd ones um, that you know, in this particular case, it was just incredibly massive compared to the other ones. Yeah, but one important point is like, 
the finding it's, it's not lots of people think of astronomy that we like take a picture of the sky and then we're like oh look there's a massive neutron star so pulsar astronomy is not like that this is based on timing of these very regular pulses of emission over many many years of observation mm -hmm. so we measure the ticks of these natural clocks these pulsars and then from the ticks we can model all these physical processes going on in the system and so this massive neutron star was only after about five years of monitoring these ticks very, very precisely that we could characterize the orbit of this pulsar around its white dwarf companion well enough to actually constrain the masses of the two objects. So our discovery process often isn't like, you know, waking up one morning and saying, oh, we made a discovery. It's like, you know, every few months adding more data to your data set, oh, look, there's a hint of this signature. Another few months, oh, wow, that signature looks even you know, stronger. And then maybe a year later, oh, we actually have a detection of this mass. And that mass still has pretty big error bars in it. Like, we don't know it exactly. Sure. And you know, another year or two or three, the error bars will go down and down and down. And we'll know it better and better and better. But that's sort of the kind of science we do. It's, well, not all of it's incremental. We do find other things that are like impulsive one-off. But much of what I do is pulse our timing. And that's kind of a very long slow incremental process of building up knowledge. So so on that that thought then, so you, you worked on this project together. You're obviously a married couple. I grew up in a family of two parents that were both organic chemists. And so a lot of my childhood, I have memories of having family conversations about molecular structure. <laughs> so what has that been like for you? I mean, what's is that dinner conversation? Is, is research? Do you steer away from that? Yeah. Occasionally, but not so as much as you might think. Like people say, like, oh, you miss just all you do at home is talk about pulsars, and that's definitely not true. And we have three kids, so it's usually like, who's driving to Trek? Who's <laughs> driving to piano? Who, I mean, honestly, we don't talk about pulsars that much. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Both, both my parents were podiatrists, so doctors. Uh, <laughs> they never brought their work home. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, you know, it, it occasionally creeps into the conversation. But I think we made like a conscious effort not to do it initially in the early years and just really just focus on other things. Um, yeah, well, we shared an office when we were, lived in England. Right. So we were like together all the time at work for five years. And so we really, we just you didn't need anyway. to talk about pulsars at home. <laughs> and we really tried to do other things. Yeah. So sw switching topics slightly. So we talked a good bit about pulsars. But Mar, is that primarily what you study, or are there other aspects along with pulsars that most of what I do is studying these pulsars? Yeah. Um, but there's lots of aspects that come into it that are um, really broad. You know, like we're using them to try to detect gravitational waves, um, which are ripples in space time. You know, that are a, a prediction of general relativity. And so this is an application of pulsars, but the science itself is very different from the pulsars themselves. Um, and both of us also do searches for radio transients, so like just bursts of radio waves. Um, and so you might have heard of these fast radio bursts. They've been in the news a lot lately, these impulsive bursts of radio waves. So we both work on this mm -hmm. um, as well. And they're probably due to some type of neutron star, like they're probably related to pulsars. Yeah. Because um, everything we study are things that happen on like really short time scales, like millisecond time scales in the radio. And all of that has got to come down to a neutron star in some way because you need something really, really small and really energetic to do it. You know, so nearly everything we do is related to that. So where did your where did your passion come for studying this? Well, for me, I would say um, I always liked astronomy in general. Um, I read a lot of books like kind of science fiction ebooks, and I read A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking when I was in high school. But I didn't know what I wanted to do, and then when I was an undergraduate at Penn State, um, I worked with a professor, and I went to Arecibo, this telescope in Puerto Rico, as an undergraduate student, and I worked on pulsar timing. Um, and uh, the pulsar that I was timing was the first pulsar to have extrasolar planets around it. Um, and I didn't make the discovery. My advisor had made that, and I was sort of helping out, like, you know, doing some checkup you know, on the, on the, uh, the system. And that was just so cool that we could detect planets like around the star, you know, a thousand light years away just from timing these pulses. And then I just stuck with that field ever since. I kind of got into it really early just from that one experience, you know, that one research experience just really had an impact. Yeah. And, and what keeps you going in this field? Is it, is it that sense of there, there might be something else There might, you know, what's that next big discovery? Is that kind of what gets you up every morning? Yeah. I mean, there's just so much we don't know. Yeah. Like, 
like every morning when I get up, there's some problem <laughs> that I do not understand. You know, like there's some something that needs to be understood. Yeah. Usually the dog needs a walk. That's the first thing. Okay. That I <laughs> so household issues and yeah. large space then, questions. Right. Okay, okay. And um, and I know both both of you do, but but Mara, I know in particular you've done a lot of work with school age age children. And can you talk a little bit about some of the programs that you've implemented in Morningtown? Because I think it's a great opportunity to start sharing that passion for science with with the future generation of, of scientists here in West Virginia. I mean, one of the very first things that Dunk and I did when we came to Morgantown back in 2007, um, was set up a program called the Pulsar Search Collaboratory. Um, and this is a collaboration with folks down at Green Bank. Um, and the aim was to get high school students looking at our data from the Green Bank Telescope and helping us identify pulsars in the data. Um, and part of it was we really just needed like more eyes on the data. We had all of these pulsar candidates, like things that might be pulsars and we needed people helping like look at the plot. Um, and we also just wanted to find a way to get kids involved in research and, and in particular kids like in the state who may not really know that these opportunities are out there and they have the biggest telescope, you know, in the entire country in their state. And um, so we've been doing that for almost 14 years now. Um, and it's been really exciting. Like lots of the kids have like been in the program as high school students, come to WVU as undergrads, they're in grad school, they've got MDs or law degrees or PhDs now. So that's been just really neat to see the impact of that. That's yeah. right. That's really wonderful. So, so again, kind of switching gears here. The next couple of questions, Duncan, you're on in the hot seat now. Um, so, kind of the first first topic we want to talk about. Mar actually just brought it up a minute ago. Is it fair to say that you were the first one to identify or characterize these fast radio bursts? No, I was the second second one. The second yeah. one. Okay. The, the first person to identify it uh, was an undergraduate student here at WVU. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of what we do is enabled by um, the work that our students can carry out, so both undergraduate and graduate students. So, um, yeah, well, like as soon as we got here, uh, within, a, within a few days, students started knocking on our doors and asking to work with us. And so one, one particular student, David, um, uh, was here for several years. And um, within that first year, he made this discovery. And we were just looking at that time just at old data mm -hmm. from, uh, from a telescope, not the Green Bank telescope, but a telescope in Australia. And um, yeah, it's one of those great moments that, you know, you just get this really amazing, lucky discovery. And, you know, he, he was in the right place at the right time. And you know, I, remember, I can still remember him bringing this in. He, he never really got that excited about things, but as excited as he could get, he was like showing me this, this plot. And um, yeah, That's that a was, great memory. it was great. Yeah. yeah. And can you explain to us what, what are they? Right. So these are fast, <laughs> fast radio bursts. We don't know fully what they are, but we, we, we know what we can see at least. And so it's a, it's a, um, over the course of a few milliseconds, typically five milliseconds, let's say we get this burst of radio waves that is just about the brightest radio source in, in the sky at that time. It's, you know, in the top 10%, let's say, of radio sources. So it's, it's really noticeable for, for a few milliseconds, but you've got to be looking in the right spot at the right time. Uh, another amazing property of it is uh, it's bright and it's, um, it's short duration, um, but it's, it's also highly dispersed. And so what happens is the radio waves, if you convert them to an audio wave, they would sound like a chirp. So it would be sort of a, like a, like a chirping sound like that, where the highest frequencies arrive at the telescope first. Uh, and that, that tells you something about how far away the source is. And it's basically the longer the, the, the chirp, the further away the and, signal. And how far away are we talking here? Because wow. I have a feeling it's probably going to be a number yeah. that's not easy for us to yeah. really even comprehend. It, it's, yeah, it's, in that, in that particular case, it was several billion light years. Can so. you put that into perspective for us at all? Well, I mean, um, a nice way to think about it is that when the source was emitting, um, the Earth was just forming. So, yeah, the, sol honestly, the solar system was, it was just forming. That's, so that's hard to fathom. By the time it arrived, we developed technology to point the telescope in that spot. And, wow. Uh, yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> that's, that's very cool to think about, though, right? That, that we're just now being able to hear and detect things that originated before mm -hmm. Earth was really right. so what the it is. The universe is about 14 billion years old, so it was, you know, 
good fraction of that time wow. uh, it's been traveling. And, and so there was an article in Wired Magazine last fall about this discovery um, and some of some of the work and also the journey to that discovery. Because my understanding is it, it there was there were some speed bumps for yeah. the academic and scientific community to really accept right. what right. these were and that they were real and not some sort of artifact. Can you talk a little bit about that and talk about kind of some of the, the difficulties there? Sure. Um, yeah. So, so the, the very first one that we found remained a single object for a long time. So um, mostly when you, you look out at the star, at the sky, you see thousands of stars. So you, you're always thinking of astronomical objects as a population. There should be more than just one. And so we had this one object and people said, well, where are the other ones? You know, have you looked, you know, what's, what's the rest of the sky that you've looked at? Have you seen more? And so we, we hadn't found any more and we, and we really felt like we should have found more of them. Um, but we, We'd only searched a limited amount of data, so we said, okay, well, from this patch of sky, we've just seen one. And so the obvious next step was to look for more. And so people started looking, um, and they found more pulses, but they turned out to be, um, to cut a long story short, they turned out to be coming from microwave ovens at the observatory. And so that. So that, not, not, not yeah. billions of light years yeah. away, but in somebody's kitchen. Several meters away, okay. yeah. But they could, they, when you open the microwave uh, oven door, you know, sometimes if, you, if you're heating up a snack and you, you can't wait for the cycle to finish, you pull the door open. At least I do, anyway. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the, the microwave is still running and it's just slowing down and it, it emits one of these chirped pulses, one of these. Uh, and it looks to the telescope just like a radio burst wow. from <laughs> outer space. So that confused people for several years. We're talking about five or six years. Um, before it really became clear that no, that was a that was a terrestrial phenomenon, uh, and what we originally found was celestial. Eventually, people found more of the ones like the one we saw. Wow! It took a long time for that. To I'm just imagining, right? Some <laughs> some graduate students having to run that experiment of like opening the microwave yeah, door and then yeah. looking at the data right, and opening right. it again. <laughs> That's and, right. Literally, what they did. And so there's you know two people on either end of a phone line. You know, one was by the microwave and the other one was in the observatory. Wow! Uh, <laughs> some high technology right, going on yeah. there. Well, and actually, and it, one of the reasons it took them a while to to do that was because. In the early days, you know, back in 2006 or so, it took us months to process the data. But um, by about 2015, by the time that they made that connection, you, the technology had advanced enough that, that you could process the data in real time. So it wasn't initially possible to even do that. Uh, so, so that's amazing. So we know that these are real now. Yes, we do. Right? Yep. And, and those discoveries have also um, connected now Green Bank to the Breakthrough Initiative. And so can you talk a little bit about what that is and, and kind of what some of the flow through from that was? I'll pass the sure. on to you. Um, so one of the, what, one of the first telescopes um, to find these radio bursts that wasn't from the original one in Australia uh, was the discovery Mora was involved in uh, using the GBT. And so they found one of these bursts in archival data with the GBT. Okay. So that was really exciting because it, it helped us to piece this detective story together to show that these sources were really celestial and were being detected by different telescopes around the Earth. Um, but a lot of the, the technology that gets used to detect pulses from pulsars or these fast radio bursts is exactly the same technology that we can, in principle, use to detect signals from ET. Um, so if a, if a signal, if an, if an extraterrestrial signal is, is emitting um, pulses, they would actually look very similar to the, to the ones that we, we see from pulsars. Okay. Um, and so the people that do these searches for extraterrestrial intelligence, that we call SETI, um, are um, a lot of them are friends and colleagues of ours. We, we share uh, algorithms and um, we, we work together on papers. Um, so there's a lot of crosstalk in that way. Um, and the people at um, the, the SETI Institute um, were able to, um, over, the, over time, build up a connection with uh, a Russian billionaire, Yuri Milne, mm. um, and were able to um, persuade him to 
to to really kickstart the initiative to look for mm-hmm. aliens again. I mean, this, this has been going on for years, right? You you remember as a student? Oh, my first trip to yeah. um, Green Bank with your father, the grad right? Student. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there were these guys looking for spending all this time looking for a study. Um, don't mention my father because my father is like a very practical person, and uh, he sells insurance, and he just couldn't believe it. He was like. Who is paying these people <laughs> to do this? Like, they're not making anything. They're not finding anything. Like, they're never going to find anything. And um, But people have spent their entire lives looking for these signals from extraterrestrials with these radio telescopes. And it's um, it's probably the best way to look for extraterrestrials. I mean, it's, it's a, a very it's a reasonable way, but the chances are still pretty small. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, Yuri, Yuri Milner is this Russian billionaire. I forget where you... Anyway, he, he gives a lot of money. Um, to groups yeah. that are trying to find SETI because he really wants to find this. And so he purchases time on the Green Bank Telescope for this purchase, for this purpose. Okay. And it's actually, it's been really good because the NSF has been dropping the funding level to Green Bank. So the National Science Foundation is cutting its funding. It needs more funds coming in to support its operation. And Breakthrough Project is buying $2 million of time a year there, which is like a fifth of the total operating budget. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really great. So it's helping to really keep the telescope going um, for all of us. Uh, That's wonderful. Yeah. And his background is in physics, correct? But then he somehow got into the venture community and became yeah. a very successful right. tech yeah. investor. And, and then, but now it's kind of going back to mm-hmm. right. physics yeah. roots. That's right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So, so kind of going on from there. So you've made a lot of discoveries uh, with the telescope, a lot of, you know, in general, the community seems like it's really moving forward with our understanding of space. What what do some of these discoveries mean for all of us sitting here? What is it helping us understand about our world or our galaxy? Gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> it's a very big question. <laughs> I mean, the stuff we do um, touches on a lot of just really kind of fundamental questions about how life um I mean, how the first galaxies formed, like how they came together in the earliest stages of the universe, how gravity works, you know, like how, how does our understanding of gravity work? What, do, what does, you know, what, were all these equations that Einstein came up with 100 years ago, are they actually correct? Mm-hmm. Um, how does star? Okay. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. As far as like practical applications, I mean, people ask all the time, like, okay, why are you doing this? What's the practical application of all of this? Um, and really, what we've done so far, I mean, fast radio bursts or pulsars aren't going to save anybody's life or um, have a real practical impact. But the few things that I always say are one, you never know, like, what technological advances you create for one project are going to have implications for many other different things. So like we do really kind of high data rate, computationally intensive work um, that has a lot of spillover into other fields. Um, Lots of the algorithms we develop um, have spillover. The systems we use are really similar to systems that people use for like radio communications and things like that. And then for me, I mean, I think the most important part for me is the inspiration that the project provides to students, right? Like kids in middle school and high school where you really want to draw them into science. They're fascinated by neutron stars and black holes and gravitational waves and this kind of stuff. And so I find it's just like a really good way um, to get kids engaged um, in STEM fields. Um, And I think that that's just super important. And that's kind of the main like big picture motivating factor for me. What we're doing now is called data science, right? That's Mm -hmm. what it's kind of evolved into. And so there's, for, for all of the community that's getting involved in that, it's, it's a really exciting way. Um, so our, our students are, for instance, developing algorithms to, um, to um, look for pulsars in, in the diagnostic plots that we produce using AI um, to, to do that directly. And, and so that, that solves many of the problems that we're now having where we're trying to look over the vast areas of sky at Absolutely. once, uh, and so we can we can really um, um, produce a very elegant solution to this problem of look, looking for these bursts using yeah. AI. Yeah. The same same algorithms that are being used um, for other applications. So, and you mentioned black holes, and and I think everybody probably remembers a you know a few 
months ago, there was some big news um, in terms of capturing the first images of, of black holes. Was that the media portraying that to be a bigger deal than it was, or was that truly a rather phenomenal event? It was a pretty big yeah. deal. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, that was many years of observations with the world's most sensitive telescopes and very sophisticated techniques to actually image the event horizon of a black hole. And I think that was as exciting to us as it was to the media. I don't sure. think it was blown out of proportion. Sure. So, so along those lines then, in terms of the media, being experts in this field, is there a certain topic that the media just gets totally wrong when it comes to space? Um, or aliens? something that drives you crazy, aliens, a aliens okay. I would say. Um, in what aspect? Well, that they're like green every, and have five arms? Every or? interview we have about whatever, like um, anything we don't understand, yeah. like these fast radio bursts mm -hmm. or other kinds of signals, um, they always have to put in there, or it could be aliens. You know, um, <laughs> they, just, they just really want it to be aliens. And that can be very frustrating. And even mention the word ET, then the entire article is, um, <laughs> Professor McLaughlin says there's ET, you know, and you can even just, yeah. they, they just really, really want there to be aliens. S similar pet peeve for you, Duncan? I would say so, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, in fairness to them, um, you can't rule out the past radio bursts that some of them are, you know, from a, of extraterrestrial origin. Mm -hmm. It's very unlikely, but... Um, <laughs> sorry, I've done it again, haven't I? <laughs> But, I, I would disagree with that. But, <laughs> what about the repeating ones? You know? <laughs> I, I, I don't think there's any way to be. Honest. But you know, in, but we we really we don't yet know what the source of them is, and that you know that therein lies the problem. Is what I'm trying to mm -hmm. say. So, mm -hmm. People do get excited about that, and of course, you know that would be one of the most amazing discoveries to to find extraterrestrial intelligence. I think it's worth saying, though, that we're, we're living in a time where we're able to image black holes and, and see black holes merging and see these pulsars. I, we're living in a time that's beyond my wildest dreams growing up as a kid, what we can do. So I don't have too many peeves to be in, in general. I have just one more very brief one. Yeah. It's generally, the way the media portrays science and like this black hole discovery is, oh, guess what? They just made this big discovery. Um, and they make it sound easy and immediate and like they just got lucky mm -hmm. um, and you need to just be some super brilliant genius scientist right. that suddenly, you know, gets lucky one day. And that's not how science works. Like all of these discoveries you hear about are many, many, many years of really, really, really hard work mm -hmm. um, by lots of people who are building things and writing software and doing the observations and mm -hmm. contributing in lots and lots of different ways. And, and I think the media doesn't really get that. Right. Um, right. Sometimes. Like, it's really, like, this doesn't portray Which is a whole shame. community yeah, and, and what people are actually. It's a nice human interest story. Yeah. But they don't, yeah. Sure. So I think, I think that's a great way to, to, to wrap this up. I think that was some phenomenal information that you shared with us. I think I certainly have a better understanding now of some of these space terms that I hear on Nova and PBS specials. Um, so at this point, I think we have a, a little bit of time left. We're going to open it up to the audience for, for questions. And I think any question generally is, is fair, fair game, sure. even if it's about aliens. <laughs> yeah. Research is going. Well, that's a great question. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's two sides to that, I would say. Um, one is to figure out what they are. Um, and I, you know, I personally think it's some sort of celestial phenomenon, um, like a, something to do with neutron stars, but actually to really figure out what they are and whether they're like, and it goes back to this idea of, sen of doing a census. You know, are there multiple populations of them or things like that? So that's one side of things that will keep many people busy for years to come. The other side is we, we might not actually truly figure out what exactly they are. Um, but even if we don't, we can use them to study the universe in new ways. And so by measuring this, this dispersion that I was um, alluding to, um, you, you not only get information from the distance, you, you also get information about the magnetic field, which is also encoded into the polarization of the radio signal. And so you can measure the, the large scale structure and magnetic field of the universe, which is absolutely mind-boggling to me that you can do that. So the, the space between galaxies you can probe, 
So they're, they're going to be useful as cosmological probes, is what the um, what the big interest from the community is. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. That's a great question. Other questions? Oh, yeah. I would like to ask you about the. Oh, hold on. One, I can't quite hear you there. Is the mic on there, Brandon? Okay. Yeah, hold it pretty close. Speak well. I'd like to ask you about the Eureka moments or the aha moments you didn't mention as they have. For the Eureka moments? Did you have Eureka moments? Did you have any aha moments? Uh -huh. What are the aha moments? What is in the aha moments? What are your aha moments? What are the aha I mean, moments me, that you had? Yeah. We spend a lot of time searching for pulsars, so trying to find new pulsars. Um, and still, every time I find a new one, it's really exciting because you look through thousands of not pulsars <laughs> to find the one signal that is an actual pulsar. So every time that happens, that's just really, really, really exciting. Um, there's been lots of other kind of just surprises. So, um, I study classes of neutron stars that are, are um, just really difficult to time, like to figure out the spacing of the pulses or the periods. And once you get what we call a solution for the pulsar, when you're able to fit a period and a model sort of for the pulsar motion in the galaxy and, and all this stuff, that's kind of an aha moment um, when you've sort of solved the pulsar and kind of figured out like where it is in space and what its orbit looks like and all this. Dunk, I'm sure, would say FRBs. Actually, I was, that was a great one, but um, I was thinking back a little further in time um, to sort of the early 2000s when I, I was fortunate enough to, to be in the right place at the right time to, to discover the, the first um, double pulsar system, or to, to be involved in that. And so we, you have, we, we were talking about these binary systems, but there's, there, there are several now, or there's, sorry, there's, there's one where we can, we can see both of them as pulsars. Um, they're both pointing towards us, which was absolutely unbelievable at the time. Um, I wasn't supposed to be analyzing the data, but, uh, <laughs> but I was alone at the observatory, and I'd just finished some software, and I thought, oh, why not just have a, have a quick look? And so that was a real nice eureka moment, but then it got me into a lot of hot water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where is all the data, and how accessible is it? Oh, that's, oh, that's a great that's a good question. question. Um, yeah, so uh, to be honest, we do not have nearly the capacity to store all the data um, that we take, and we, we actually have very rudimentary data storage solutions in general. Um, we have a ton of disks sitting in our respective offices, just hard drives filled with data. Um, we have a computer cluster which can store some of it, but we can't nearly store all the data that we've mm -hmm. taken. We're starting to move towards more like cloud storage. Um, so some of our, our data is now stored on the cloud and we really need to, to get there. And the reason is that every time we go back and look at the old data, we find new things because we have better algorithms. And so I bet if we could get all that data off all those disks mm -hmm. um, and apply new algorithms to it, we would find new stuff, but, but it's like really difficult. <laughs> um, we haven't done a very good job. But, but anyone can get access to it. They just have to have to ask. So the, the data become public right, from these, uh, um, like from the Green Bank Telescope, because because the NSF have, has an open skies policy, they they make the data public to anyone after two years. And so you have to ask the astronomer. And the, but they are legally obligated to give it to you. And <laughs> so yeah, so just, if anybody just let wants us know. to do some home, you know, pulsar research. Yeah. There you go. There's so your end. Literally right down the street uh, in Whitehall. So. Great, great. Yeah, what, other, what other questions do you have? Yeah, so uh, thank you for being here, first of all. But um, something that was kind of like I was thinking of as you were talking is what are your guys' biggest bottlenecks in your work? So I, the first thing my mind jumps to is, okay, so how do we go from like collecting this much data in a year to scanning like half the sky in like an hour or a day? So what's uh, technologically keeping us from getting there? Good question. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the what, what what you just said really was kind of um, is one of the bottlenecks. It's like being able to design a telescope to to see large areas of sky, let alone collect collect and process it. So most of the telescopes that we've been using throughout our careers 
they see about as much sky as the full moon on the on a, on a clear night. So it's that patch of sky that they can see at any given time. They don't see the whole sky like some, some of the uh, X-ray and gamma-ray telescopes do. So that's a real challenge for us, but that's changing now with new designs um, that people at, at um, the Statler College are, are involved in as well. Um, so that, that, that's yeah, a big, that's big a challenge. challenge. But then there's another challenge that will come from that, which is having the computing power yeah. to process those really wide fields of view. Um, and so we're moving towards a lot of like real-time processing and a lot of machine learning. Yeah. And I think the next decade, this machine learning is going to be a really big challenge. Like, how do you develop algorithms um, that can reliably detect everything in a data uh, in a data set that we now might need human eyes to do? And how how do we trust AI to be able to to process our data um, kind of carefully and quickly? Because we're going to have to delete it. We can't store all of it going forward once we have these humongous amounts of data. And so that's kind of scary. Like we'll need to process it in real time and know that we're not missing anything. I would also say just people. Like there are so many projects and so much data um, that they're really interesting to do. And we just don't even have enough students to kind of work in the field um, and do all the data analysis that could be done on a slide. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, speaking of technology, how far behind the times is the radio telescope compared to the, the state of the art stuff? Um, it's pretty state of the art. So one thing to point out about radio telescopes is because the radio waves are like, you know, this big, and you actually don't need incredibly smooth surfaces like you might need with like an optical mirror. Um, so if you go look at Green Bank or Arecibo, you might think, oh, it's, it's not really state of the art because the surface is not perfectly smooth. It's made up of tiles. But that's just fine um, for radio astronomers. We don't need like super smooth, perfect surfaces. Um, I think astronomy though, like in particular, radio astronomy really is pushing the frontiers of technological development. Um, like our challenge, we wanna build many, many radio dishes and link them all up and combine the signals and you need extremely fast computational um, power and links between all the telescopes. So I think that I think we're kind of at the forefront. I don't think we're behind. I think we're really kind of pushing the, the frontiers in a lot of ways. Sometimes we can find algorithms from um, other um, fields um, that are useful to us. And so that there's, there's a communication barrier between different fields, you know, communications, um, radio communications and uh, radio astronomy. There's a, there's a communication barrier between those. So that's, that's sometimes an impediment. But yeah, as Morris says, it's... Uh, we're, we're developing things that are useful to them, too. We have time for one more question. Yeah. So, uh, you guys have found the, uh, I'm a little bit here. <laughs> um, you guys found one of the largest uh, neutron stars uh, to date. Does that help us find out any uh, closer thresholds between a neutron star and a black hole? Like, uh, do we know now maybe possibly a range at which uh, supernova will go from creating yeah, that's a great question. Um, so our knowledge of what the kind of lowest mass black hole is and the highest mass neutron star is is not real clear. There's kind of a fuzzy boundary between them. We think it's probably like around three times the mass of the sun, something like that. Um, and this, this one is 2.14 times the mass of the sun. Um, the last one was about two. <laughs> And so we're, we're just pushing that boundary up and up and up and up. Um, the LIGO project has been detecting black holes through their gravitational wave emission. They are also measuring masses, and they're pushing the black hole boundary down and down and down. So eventually, um, we are going to have good constraints because they're going to meet at some point, right? I think over the next decade, mm -hmm. um, we're going to find out exactly um, where that, that line lies. So it's a pretty exciting time. But already the models that, um, that predicts um, how, how neutron stars behave, so some of them have problems um, with a 2.14 solar mass neutron star, and so that, that's already a, an interesting constraint, so that, that's only going to get... Yeah. And there's a cool experiment uh, at the moment you might have heard of called NISA, um, Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. Explorer yeah. uh, it's on the uh, International Space Station, it's a module on there, uh, and it's it's able. It's an X-ray instrument, and it's able to measure the radii of neutron stars directly, 
um, for the first time um, in, to, to, to really good accuracy. And so that, that's going to really help us with that problem too. Yeah. Well, with that, Duncan Mara, thank you so much for sharing your evening with us. Really appreciate the time. Uh, we will have more upcoming of these Real Talk series, so please be on the lookout for your calendar and for our emails. Uh, please join us for our for our next ones that we'll have continuing this semester. So thank you again. Thanks for having us. <laughs>